Do you patron enough? You don't need a power? No, no, no. he doesn't. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to next seminar. Uh, so today's speaker is Hakim Rotherspoon from Cornell University. Uh, Hakim, uh, he is a professor there at the computer science department. Uh, he got awards from uh, NSF, DARPA, IBM, Intel, NetApp. I don't know whether I forget anything. Uh, he got his uh, his bachelor in University of Washington, and then his PhD from Berkeley. When he sent his bio. He even put an excla exclamation mark in Berkeley. I don't know whether you want to just buy something for us here. But, uh, and today he's going to talk about Sonic and some very interesting work they did and they presented in NSDI 2013 and this year as well. Uh, thanks for coming. Great. Excellent. Thank you. So I was saying that it is great to be back in the Bay Area. Uh, I'm in upstate New York now and it was actually in fact snowing yesterday. So there was snow on the ground when I left, and it's nice to be here in the sunshine, the uh, golden light. So um, as Yas was saying, I did graduate from Berkeley. I have actually been to Stanford a number of times. We actually had a course back in the day where we went back and forth each week from uh, Berkeley to Stanford. So it's nice to be nice to be back. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, the cloud from a really from a network perspective. And not just a network, but from the, the lowest layer of the network. And so how we can actually improve the security and performance of the cloud. SONIC stands for Software Network Interface Card. And so I'll get into that. So the key here is that you know, we've all heard that the cloud is, is supposed to save the day. It's supposed to come in. It's supposed to be like a commodity, uh, just like electricity and whatnot. You uh, use it for uh, the government. The military uh, industry use it. It reduces costs. It's always available. It just does whatever uh, we need to do. And if you ever have a problem, it's almost like that commercial one that had that easy button. There's a cloud button. So this cloud is going to come in and save the day. What is this cloud? The cloud is essentially network access to a seemingly infinite amount of compute and storage. Okay, so this is according to the National Institute of Science and Technology. But underneath it, it's, it's really a distributed system. Compute, storage, and network access. And at heart, I'm really a distributed systems person. My PhD was based on a system called OceanStore. OceanStore was a system designed to store the world's information forever. Um, uh, we my thesis, if you're ever to download and look at it, you know, it says that there was a challenge question essentially that said, how do you store a mole of bytes for a thousand years without losing a single bit? And so that was, that was the goal of Ocean Store, and that was what my thesis was based off of. So it's really a distributed system, but it's uh, at the heart of any distributed system is the network. Okay? And so uh, as a result, much of my research touches network, compute, and storage. I have a system called uh, Zen Blanket. Sested, essentially, it's nested virtualization. And uh, it was described in Eurosys. And it, what it does is it allows you to take an instant slide and migrate it from one provider to another. For example, you can uh, take an instance and migrate it from Azure to uh, Amazon, and then to Cornell, and then to IBM. And the way, like I said, the way it works is that second layer, uh, instead of starting a <coughs> OS, we start a hypervisor. And with that second layer hypervisor, you could then do anything with the provider. And it does actually uh, work. So we have a paper that describes that. Not only can you migrate an instance live, but now you can uh, actually encapsulate uh, some of your communication, so layer uh, three and layer two, and so you can actually emulate the entire topology, and so you can actually migrate an entire ecosystem. <coughs> it's almost like picking up a city and migrating it from one provider to another. Uh, what motivates this work is um, really trying to prevent vendor lock-in and allow you to use any provider interchangeably. Uh, and so that was described in a paper called Virtual Wire, 
And also we have, I have a system called RACS, Redundant Array of Cloud Storage, that then essentially, uh, you can view it as RAID amongst the cloud, so it then allows you to uh, use any cloud provider in a training room, <coughs> and it reduces the cost of switching from one provider to another. Uh, so one provider goes out of business as Nirvana fit, or change their pricing scheme, or you could maybe uh, uh, take advantage of some other lower prices like Google Compute, for example. So the key here is that a lot of my research is motivated by distributed systematized heart. And uh, today that's uh, cloud computing. And I have quite a bit of work in networking, uh, in storage, in computation. Um, some of the interesting points here are in networking, we've inve I've investigated wide, completely wireless data centers, so using 60 gigahertz transceivers and assuming that you get rid of all wires except for power. How would you architect the data center? How would it perform? What would be the fault tolerance characteristics? This was a, a best paper that described uh, that kind of paper design. We went a little bit further than just a paper design, but it was very, uh, very interesting and, and novel. So there's quite a bit of uh, work here in each one of those areas. I graduated students in each one of these areas. So uh, a student in networking is at Google now, one's at IBM, and another one's at, at uh, Facebook in each one of those areas. But today, uh, like Yana said, I'm going to focus on the network, um, on uh, improving the performance and the security of our network and looking at the <coughs> lowest layer. So really, when you get all down to and you take all the, the cruft away, the network is the center. If you are um, any business, if you are a government, if you are the Department of Defense, if the network goes down, you're in trouble. Uh, so if you're the military, the network has to work, and it has to work reliably, and it has to perform. And it turns out that there are quite a few situations where it doesn't work as expected. Um, here is a map of the National Lambda Rail. And what I did with the National Lambda Rail was I asked them to create me my own path. It's a $100 million network. Uh, it was designed for network researchers and people in the sciences. And it was interesting, not many people were using it at the time. So when I came to them re with this request, I was surprised they actually did it. <laughs> So I, they created this loop, and the reason why I wanted to do that was I wanted both <coughs> ends of the network to be at Cornell. I was doing some studies of, of primary backup storage system uh, from data center A to data center B, and it's just easier for me to have both data centers physically in the same place. This is described in File and Storage uh, Technologies 2009. And so what we wanted to do is, it was a 10 gigabit network, we wanted to uh, back up, you know, at 10 gigs and whatnot. It was a paper called Smoke and Mirrors File System that talked about this intermediate consistency state that once it's in the network, you can say that it's uh, safe, you know, almost similar to a synchronous backup. And uh, so we actually had a real system that then tested this out. But what we found out was performance was terrible. And it wasn't because it was congested. Uh, nobody else was using it, and this is uh, uh, almost a uh, completely isolated uh, link at the time. Uh, so that wasn't the issue. The packets were actually making it to the other end. Uh, so what was going on? And so we see here is a number of papers uh, that then investigated what was going on with the performance. There was a DSN paper where we instrumented all types of part of the end host and the network itself. It wasn't until this Internet Measurement Conference paper in 2010 where we actually figured out what was going on. And what we did there, uh, it was the problem was eluding us. But what we did there was essentially, uh, I worked with a physicist, uh, Dan Friedman. This is, you guys know Mike Friedman uh, at Princeton. This is his brother, his older brother actually, uh, who's also an Iraq War vet and stuff learn to fly helicopters and stuff like that. But anyways, he's a trained physicist. And so he, I was describing this problem, he was, became interested. And so he said, uh, you know, let me build a neck out of a laser and a oscilloscope. 
which was kind of crazy. So we used a, a lucent uh, oscilloscope to capture these waveforms. But essentially what we wanted to do was um, hook this laser up to our router. We hooked it up to our campus router. We uh, modulated this laser at 10.3125 gigabyte, and uh, we had to obey the 10 gigabit Ethernet standards. And the reason we wanted to do this was we wanted to control the spacing. So we wanted to test what was going on with the packets spacing lines. Uh, and so we introduced these packets with uniform spacing. They were exact, no deviation whatsoever. We controlled the timing to the atom second, uh, which was a little bit insane. And then we captured uh, at the other end, which was again a Cornell and a telescope, what actually happened. And it turned out that even though we may have been sending at a low rate, the packets were being batched together within the network. And we received short bursts at 10 gigabits per second. And every once in a while, the end host would have some scheduling delays. You would drop some packets, and performance would go through the floor because of long bandwidth delay product. But the key here is that all of this was completely hidden from us because it was below uh, layer three. The space between packets are idle symbols and they're thrown away from the network interface pattern. So we couldn't observe uh, the pattern here. So from everything we did beforehand, this pattern looked equivalent to this pattern. And we couldn't see that the traffic was actually <laughs> arriving very bursty, very short bursts of 10 degrees. But, I mean, why is this a problem? Like, is, if, as long as you have, a, you know, adequate buffering, you shouldn't drop packets, right? I mean, you're sending at the same rate. Yeah, so it, it shouldn't be a problem. In fact, we are sending at a low rate. Yeah, so... Um, it so it, it was almost in the I mean, matter this, of the rate. It shouldn't be a problem. Yeah, so it was just that the, the machines we were using at the time at the end host, every once in a while, uh, between the NIC and the host, uh, we would drop packets. Um, those... Uh, there were, we, what we surmise is that there was probably a scheduling delay of servicing uh, the buffer, <coughs> uh, you'd actually overrun the buffer and you actually would drop packets. But the packets were not dropped within the network. Oh. They were dropped at the dropped end at the dust. Yeah, so it's, it's basically a bug in the end dust. It, it was at, at the time we were using a machine that had a uniform memory architecture, and so the, uh, the bus was actually a bottleneck as well. And then some of those things that were going on. So you could maybe call it a bug. It actually was not as much of a problem once we went to a more uh, newer interface and also had more cores and stuff like that. But, so the key here is that uh, it may not necessarily, necessarily have been a yeah. fundamental problem because you know end to end everything was ten. Yeah. It's, it's basically an unbalanced system on where, where the where the person is provided by the hard one piece of hardware saturated in another bus. Associated yeah. yeah. Also, this phenomenon is pretty well known, right? I mean, in even whatever early nineties, there were paper by Raj Jain and others that talk about packet trains. Yeah. So that, yeah. that so was phenomenon that was well known, with, right? That was with um, uh, different Ethernet hosts on the network, and it ended up being bursty. This was actually there was no one else on the network. It was just our traffic. It was actually some routing elements. We actually have another paper that can mathematically describe how this could occur. So that, that's, I agree, that's not really too much of the issue. One of the issues was we couldn't really observe the problem in any easy manner. I mean, good Lord, I had to work with a physicist uh, in order to uh, figure out what was going on in layer one and two. So there was no really easy way to do it. Um, my trade is really more CS. So I'm coming from the background where, you know, anything below layer three, so layer one and two is more of a black box. For, so, so for one, more of a systems person, <coughs> what we want to do is be able to uh, have some view into what's going on with layer one and two uh, without being a trained physicist or uh, hardware engineer, for example. So this, is, this actually shows our setup there with a laser and an oscilloscope. And what we've done now is we've essentially taken this entire setup, which uh, was hardware, uh, but everything else was, uh, we actually recreated the entire network stack in software. We took this setup and shrunk it down uh, to a PCI board that you can plug in, 
and then you can actually uh, interact with the up down to layer one and software in real time. And this is a system that we call Sonic. So Sonic is a software and network interface card, different than SDN, software defined network. And so the goal here is to give a systems person view into the entire network stack. So it's I, kind of I would argue that this is software defined networking, just at a different layer. layer. Right. So I, it's like, I guess it's like, what I meant is that it's yeah. kind of orthogonal to what people think about as SDN when you're talking about separating the controller from the, the yeah, data. Yeah. Often people just talk about the control plane, but you know, clearly you can do things in the data plane and layer one. And things like software radio do something similar. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So this is this is analogous to software defined radio. In fact, that's uh, there's a paper called Sora, and our design for Sonic actually. Uh, doesn't exactly copy, but it is inspired a lot by the hardware design and so on. And so what we want to do is essentially then uh, take <coughs> layer one and two, and uh, instead of having that be a black box, allow software access to that entire stack. This would then allow you to do very, um, turns out what allows you to do very precise network measurements uh, by having access to layer one. It turns out you're always sending a 10 gigabit, and if I can touch every bit, then I can have access to 100 picosecond granularity. Uh, the NSDI paper this year described a covert channel. I'll talk about that a little bit. But we can essentially modulate packets at the sub nanosecond <coughs> level and send uh, covert ones and zeros. And they actually work and we can recover those. Uh, so that's quite interesting. Well, we can profile uh, network elements. So I'll describe each one of those. So the key here is that now we have view into the entire network stack. We can use this to increase the performance, at least understand it, uh, the security, the availability of our network, and in some sense, our, our daily lives. OK? So the uh, Sonic is a software network interface card, and uh, we can use that to improve things, like I said. The key here is separating uh, what is set so we're actually going to have the software uh, do any manipulation of the bits. And the hardware is just then going to send the bits. So the hardware is just going to send and receive, and any interpretation or manipulation is going to uh, happen in software. And then, uh, here is just my uh, note that this is not exactly the same as software-defined networking. I do actually have uh, some stuff in software routers, and I do have some collaboration with Nate Foster uh, as well, so software-defined networking. We have a Gates Hall at Cornell. Um, we just got it, just moved in in January. And we're putting in a software defined network in there as well. Uh, that should be ready to go pretty soon. But anyway, so that's, I'm not going to talk about uh, that exactly. But, um, uh, excuse me, so what I am going to talk about is the, how Sonic is built and then some of those uh, application network research applications a little bit more in depth. Okay. So first of all, this is our uh, general network stack uh, where we have the application layer and whatever you want to send gets uh, broken up into uh, segments or whatnot and then gets encapsulated into the transport layer, TCP segments or whatnot, the header put on. Then gets encapsulated more within the, the network layer, IP <coughs> packets with another uh, header put on. Then it gets encapsulated uh, even more into uh, layer two, the, the data leak layer to train, for example, with a header and uh, some preamble and a, a cyclical redundancy check. You want know, to make sure that uh, all the bits are the same. So, so far, so good. You know, this is just general networking 101. And so what happens below this, a lot of people uh, you know, don't really concern themselves, uh, especially if you're a systems person. But it turns out what happens is that each Ethernet frame is then broken up, this is pretend to be in it, is then broken up into 64-bit blocks. Uh, those 64-bit blocks then have a two-bit header uh, put on it, where you have a transition from a zero to one, or one to zero. Each one of those 64-bit blocks then uh, are then scrambled, so that you have some mix of zeros and ones, so you don't burn out your network interface card. Uh, furthermore, each one of these blocks, before they're uh, scrambled, they're encoded to have a startup Ethernet frame, <coughs> which that S there, or end of Ethernet frame block, the T there for termination, or an 
uh, data Ethernet frame block or a idle Ethernet frame block. Okay? And so these are now uh, where you get this 64 slash 66 bit, bit encoding. And that's also why it's not running at 10 gigabit per second, but instead 10.3125 uh, gigabit on the wire. And then we have the uh, little bit lower in the, in the physical layer. We then uh, take the bits and change the bit width uh, down to 16 bits with the gearbox. And then essentially that gets uh, serialized and then sent out the network on the wire. Okay? So that's the 10 gigabit Ethernet stack in, in one minute. And the key here is that between uh, every Ethernet uh, frame are inserted some number of idle symbols. And so at the start of Ethernet frame, depending on where that frame starts, you'll have some idle symbols. And uh, at the end, or in between packets, you'll have some number of idle symbols. The idle symbol is seven to eight bits. And like we said, since it's always sending, each bit then is about, uh, about 97 uh, picoseconds wide, or you round that to 100 picoseconds. So in some sense, if you can just have access to these idle symbols and just count them, then you have a very accurate sense of time, at least time relative uh, to itself, so the inner packet uh, spacing. I mean, you're still looking at the pads of the What's that? The Ethernet protocol could add some gaps between packets. Yes, this is the so Ethernet protocol. Yes. Okay. And so it's always sending. So if you're not actually sending data, you'll send idle symbols. So it's <coughs> always sending at 10 gigabit. That's why you have this very accurate notion of time. So all this process was uh, treated as black box, as you said before, right? Yeah, for a systems first. Yeah. <coughs> yes. Uh, and this is all clogged to the, basically clogged to the sender, and you sort of recover the timing of the receiver. Yes, and you're able to do that within the, the session that physical way. That's what that PMA and PMD uh, do. <coughs> and so the key here, then, is that uh, all of this happened below this uh, this software hardware boundary, which the network interface card did everything that I just showed you in terms of the encoding and scrambling and setting out the bits. And then, uh, you know, parts of uh, layer three and up uh, were done in software. Okay? And so as a result, then, uh, all the timing information between packets would then be lost uh, once you get to your application. So your application then has no way to know what the actual spacing was between packets because we lost some of that very accurate time information. So what we want to do then, the goal of Sonic was then to push that boundary low so that you could actually access layer one in software. And so in software, we could then have that very accurate notion of time. We could just count the idle symbols and we know that 700, um, 700 of a nanosecond have passed, or, or seven nanoseconds. You just literally just count the bits. And so we're able to do that, and we're able to do that in software, writing just C code. The paper that was described this year literally was 50 lines of C code. Okay. Uh, so now we can talk about the inner packet gap. That's what the IPG is or the inner packet <coughs> delay, which is the same thing, except you add in the size of the, the packet. This is different than uh, the net FPGA uh, project, which you know looks at uh, subsense routers and, and uh, some of that functionality in hardware. So the, we actually have a board from the same company, and they're actually very similar boards. Uh, and one key difference is that you know, we actually have that physical layer of internet and software. It wasn't uh, possible to do that with the uh, NetFPGA 10G board because they actually have a physical layer of chip uh, that prevented us from doing what we wanted. <coughs> so anyway, so this just shows the difference. We had a question related to that. <coughs> okay, so then with SOC then... Presumably, presumably you need more, you need, you know, more FPGA space or some FPGA space to handle the handle the software layer one, which is offloaded to hardware in the FPGA. Uh, so for, yeah, that's actually a very good uh, comment. So this is actually our design for Sonic. 
everything below that red line is in hardware, and everything above this red line is in software. These rectangular uh, boxes are cores. So we actually do the, the encoding and scrambling for the sending and receiving with separate cores. We do the creating of the checksum and the verifying of the checksum with the separate core. And then we even uh, have some application core that can then implement some functionality that we want. And we separate this. There's actually you know, some shared memory and a DMA ring and everything uh, where the hardware communicates with the software. And uh, within the FPGA, that's when we change the bitmits and do all the stuff we need to do. And then the transceiver, uh, which is right over here, is then what takes the serialized bits and sends that out. Uh, on the wire or receive it. Okay. So this is the uh, this is the actual entire system, and uh, we do actually have these are kernel threads as well, and we also have some user level uh, threads that you can uh, write user level C code. In fact, uh, this slide right here shows a packet generator and uh, capture application where you may define um, you know, the, where the end hosts are, so the source and destination IP address, the max and stuff like that, of course. But the key here is that you can also talk about how many idle symbols to put in between every packet. So uh, this right here for the packet generator, um, right here, it'll just sit in loop and create packets. It'll insert exactly 12 idles between every packet. And you can give it a trace, or you can give it some type of algorithm as well, so that that can vary. But the key is, if you said 12, it'll generate exactly 12 idols, and then it'll be exactly whatever 12 times 100 picoseconds is, without any uh, deviation. So it will be uh, exact. And then whatever we capture, uh, and this just shows an example of a, of a capture loop right there, then you can actually capture what the inner packet spacing was exactly. Uh, in fact, in a, another slide, I'll show you uh, an example of that. So tell me something I'm missing. So you said even in your original experiment, the transmitter was doing its job perfectly, right? It was sending packets with regular interval and all of that. The receiver side, uh, the physical layer was doing its job. It is the layer above that that was messing it up. So yeah, so it was the... You, so doing all of that at the physical layer, how does it help to solve the, the original problem? Does it? Or? Yeah, so so with our design, we actually <coughs> took the scheduler away, so there's actually no scheduler. It's just sitting there in a, in a loop, and it's always servicing these uh, DMA rings that we have. With the, what I talked about before, there was a scheduler, it wasn't sitting there in a tight loop, and you can imagine taking some type of delay due to scheduling. And as a result, that DMA ring uh, may fill up. So these are, these are kernel threads, and they are uh, in a fairly tight loop. We also have some very efficient FIFO, uh, uh, FIFO uh, buffers between them so that we can communicate. So between the hardware and software is a DMA ring. We also have a FIFO between each uh, core as well. This shows, what I wanted to show here was uh, what I was talking about, which is that if we generate packets with exactly 12 idols in between them, or some number of idols, then this is an example uh, of that type of experiment. We have on the x-axis here, this inner packet gap measured in bits. <coughs> so for this particular setup, running at one gigabit per second with 1,500 byte packets, we could put exactly 113,340 bits between every packet. And the y-axis then would be the PDF, or, or we could do a CDF as well. But the key here is that there's no deviation, no deviation whatsoever. We would then, uh, as a simple experiment, um, send packets into one port of a switch, and then uh, via another port of a switch, receive it at another end for Sonic, and then measure what we get out, and then you can see how much the spacing between packets were perturbed. And so this then uh, shows, again, on the x-axis, that inner packet spacing, and then the frequency, this is the log axis, 
uh, for the y-axis, it shows that um, you know that the uh, there is some randomness um, uh, within each routing element. And in fact, if we were to go over some number of routing elements, you can then start to describe how batching uh, packets, packet trains mm -hmm. may occur fairly naturally. So the key here is that you know in software and fairly easily I, uh, the application I wrote wasn't too complicated. I can now fairly accurately describe uh, some network element. In fact, I probably could even describe a network uh, path. I can create some uh, fingerprint of, of a network. I can also do uh, the experiment that I talked about before uh, with the physicist, so Dan Friedman, I can now do it uh, fairly easily. You know, just write a nice simple experiment, 12 idols or whatever the, the data rate should be, however many idols there should be between every packet. I write that and then I can write the capture. I showed you the, the code for that in the previous slide. That, what took us, um, you know, 10 months to do beforehand, now essentially uh, undergrad, you know, can do that. And, and have fairly accurate uh, uh, control and measurements, okay? And so now we can start to understand what's going on with the network a little bit easier. Uh, we've also <laughs> done this with um, the same experiment right here with some other network elements. So this shows uh, we have a Cisco 6500 uh, router, which was our production router on campus. We have some other IBM or Cisco routers where we perform the same experiment where we uh, generated packets at some data rate. Uh, this is six gigabit per second, 1500 byte size packets. And we measure how much that routing element perturbs uh, the spacing. And so this then shows essentially a, a, you know, a different fingerprint, if you will, for each different routing element, how it responds. This is a net uh, uh, FPGA, 10G. And so you couldn't actually perform the same uh, experiments. So part of the reason is that there's this uh, level of arbitration within the net FPGA, which prevents you from having the same level of uh, control that we have with this side. But so we can describe a net FPGA as well. So the packet size really matters, right? Because the larger the packet, the less gaps you got. Yeah, so, so uh, packet size, data rate, uh, matter. Yeah, go ahead. Go the same source of destination. That's right. Do you also have these kinds of fingerprints if you go over a multi hop path? So that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, uh, so if you have multiple hop paths, you could then, and we, we do uh, have this in our paper this year for NSDI. We actually uh, use that in order to create, and I'll talk about this next, a covert channel. So we uh, use this to understand uh, over a network path, uh, what's the distribution that packet uh, spacing gets, inner packet spacing gets perturbed. And then we use that information to then uh, encode a zero and one in a timing channel. So we then change the uh, the width of the packet so that we could actually uh, measure how much it would be perturbed and that it would actually retain that level of perturbation all the way to the other end. And we can say, oh, I set a one because it's far apart, or I set a zero because it's close enough. So I'll, I'll show you that in a second. But the answer is yes, you can use this to understand uh, an entire network path. But in this, if there are uh, certain boxes for which you don't have this fingerprint or this kind of a transfer function, then does that? Yeah, that so, you, so we haven't gone very far in this, you know, in terms of figuring out how, the, how they, uh, these signals combine together. We've, we've gone as far as what I sh just described a second ago for cooler channels. But to actually understand, okay, there's, on this path, you know, there's 10 routers and two Cisco and IBM or the type of Cisco routers. We haven't gone that far to actually mm -hmm. describe it. So it's less of light traffic, uh, like no congestion, or? Uh, so that, is there any other cross traffic, I think is what you're asking. Well, that yeah, so that, that, would, that would change the patterns a bit as well, because right. that adds more oh, to yeah. that. Yeah, so actually let, let me, uh, 
let me talk about uh, just a little bit about the. You have a question? Yeah. Have you considered beacons? In other words, just tracers through this occasionally, so that you can actually profile on that as opposed to the other traffic. Uh, so, like I said, we haven't gotten that far too, but what we have started doing is just um, profiling different routing elements that we have and then seeing how they combine together. So, one other concern is uh, the supply chain management. So, if you had, uh, you know, you don't have control of the entire uh, manufacturing process of the switcher router. And, you know, with the DOD, you know, for example, they're concerned uh, could there actually be some code or functionality in there where you can now exfiltrate information. And so uh, we are looking at that question with uh, covert channels. Uh, could you, uh, a router or some network element actually exfiltrate data via a covert channel? And so a covert channel, you know, you're hiding uh, communication um, you know, within the obvious communication. So at some level, there's two levels of covert channels, a storage channel and a timing channel. A storage channel, you're changing bits within the protocol, so the TCP or IP header, you're changing uh, perhaps unused bits to the said encoded zeros and ones. Those are fairly easy to, uh, uh, to do and to also detect or prevent. With the timing channel, you're changing the spacing between packets. And like I said, you have a, uh, a one maybe far apart, and a zero is uh, closer. And usually this is done at layer three and higher. So even timing channels are fairly <coughs> easy to, uh, to detect. There's a statistical way to try and hide it, and then statistical ways to actually find them as well. So what we want to do is create a, a storage or timing channel using the physical layer. And so we did this. And uh, if you were to look at the 10 gigabit Ethernet standard, that's what this is. Uh, you don't need to understand all of this. This is a, you know, the encoded uh, idle block or starter frame block or end of frame block. But the key here is that there are parts of the standard that aren't used. So you could actually then use um, those unused parts of the standard to put in a zero or one. We did this, it works. Uh, the problem is it only works for one hop, uh, you know, two elements that are directly connected. It doesn't really work uh, transfer because as soon as it goes hits that router, uh, it doesn't retain the, uh, it actually decodes and then re-encodes. Okay, so what we then looked at was uh, a timing channel, and it turns out that that actually does work. So what we did here is that we actually have a packet that we then make uh, perhaps 100 nanoseconds further apart or 100 nanoseconds closer together. So just slightly further apart or closer together uh, so that you know, uh, most elements wouldn't even notice and it would be completely invisible to any software and host and to see if that actually works. And Perhaps even to our surprise, it not only does it work, but actually works uh, quite well. With a uh, people ask, what type of capacity can you have with this covert channel? So with a covert channel, it depends on the packet per second rate. Uh, if you're sending at a gigabit per second um, with 1,500 size packets, then that packet per second rate translates to about uh, 80 kilobits per second. So I can. If the over rate is about a gigabit per second, then I can have a covert rate of about 80 kilobits uh, per second. And this is directly related to the packet size and the, and the data rate. And that actually works. It works with cross traffic. So we did this uh, on the, the NLR. At this point, uh, the NLR had uh, one to two gigabits of cross traffic uh, per hop. Uh, which, you know, that perturbed the spacing a little bit. And it also worked with less than a 10% bit error rate. So we're actually able to recover more than 90% of the bits. And if you use four error correction, and you can get that much, much higher. And like I said, this would be completely invisible to any software editors. So this is what was described in NSDI this year. How uh, high capacity this is. So usually when you talk about timing channels, in order to hide them, they're usually talking tens to hundreds of bits per second. So this is 
uh, three orders of magnitude faster and more effective, and also, like I said, invisible to to an ant host. How does, how does this change as your link utilization increases? Because often on the real internet, at some point you're going to get a bottle of that with an X link, which is you know 80 or 90 percent, or you know, kind of fully used to the extent that it works. Yeah. So the question is, how does this change as you increase utilization or approach uh, congestion? So the key there is that. Um, uh, you have to uh, increase the amount of, of space that you put in uh, to encode a zero or one. So for an NLR with two, about two gigabits of cross traffic per host, we needed about a microsecond. Um, if there was no cross traffic at all, it was about 100 nanoseconds. That means that- um, So that's like 20% that's like if you try like, you know, higher, like, you know, 80, 90, or, you know, because if you think of, your, of being in what you want as a network operator, is you sort of don't want to over-provision and you want some, basically yeah. you want to be at the point where you have a little bit of congestion. Yeah, so the, the, the answer is that, yes, we tried a uh, various amount in, in our paper, and at some level it doesn't work. Um, so with, with the two gigabit cross-traffic and, uh, and one to two microsecond of modulations, it actually worked with less than 10% of the error rate. As you increase the amount of cross traffic to three or four on a 10 gigabit uh, network path, then it was no longer effective in a sense that we didn't get that below the 10% of the error rate. And I do actually have that information, but it's on my other laptop. I'll check the paper. Yeah, yeah I, was, I was going to be able to flip to, uh, I have some graphs, but. I brought an HDMI interface, so sorry. <laughs> uh, not able to, to show that. But in any case, that is in the paper, and it does show as you go, uh, we did experiments as you go more hops, as you add more cross traffic, uh, where is that point that you can get it below the 10% of the area? What percent utilization does that two gigabits per second represent? And it's what, 20%? So I mean, if it's 10 gigabit, 10 gigabit, what's yeah. That? Yeah, is, there some, is there some knee in the curve of where, where, it, uh, where it becomes pretty impossible quickly to? Yeah, so uh, for, there, there were, so we, we did experiments and right, you know, right about, you know, two to three is where it got expensive. That just means that, so if it was two gigabit cross traffic, then we needed to modulate the spacing by about a microsecond. If it was three or four, then you'd have to go to four microseconds. And part of what we wanted to do was have a little bit error rate. The other part we wanted to do was have it essentially invisible to a software end host. So if you want, at four microseconds, it's still pretty much invisible, uh, but much beyond that, you can start to see it at a, at a software end host. And so this shows that, for example, um, sending at a gigabit per second, then uh, with 1,500 byte packets, then you have uh, 3,000, 3,500 idles between every packet. So if I had um, a uniform traffic at one gigabit, uh, then I would have exactly 3,562 idles between every packet. Now if I want to encode a zero or one, uh, and I had a 100 microsecond modulations, then I would subtract about 128 idols to make a zero, or I would add about 120 idols to make a one. Okay, so this is, I could send uh, a signal exactly like that. And then for the receiver, uh, what I want to do is then measure what the interpacket gap is. And so this is a CDF, and it shows that for the most part, I was able to tell whether it was a zero or one, whether the spacing was you know, about 100 microseconds left, less than uh, that average uh, interpack delay, or about 100 microseconds more. So with, with Sonic, I was able to recover more than 90% of the bit set. Uh, in fact, this was over 99%. Uh, now, if I have some software end host, this then shows that, you know, I wasn't able to accurately uh, recover that interpack gap. In fact, uh, in order to, for a lot of software end hosts to operate at 10 gigabits per second, there's the matching that goes on between the NIC 
and the, and the host. So that's why most of the packets have fairly small inner packet uh, spacing and packet delays. Um, and so there's no way, to, this, essentially this is completely invisible to some software apps. They can't see this at all. Okay, and so now, um, I said, guess given on the time, let me go ahead and uh, head towards wrapping this up. So one of the questions is, how would you actually prevent a Cobra chat? There's a couple things that you could do. One, you could renormalize the inner packet spacing. Uh, so that's probably the most effective way. Um, I don't know if you would ever be able to always detect uh, if there's a covert channel, but you can suspect if there's one. Uh, I don't have the graph on this laptop, but you can actually see that we separate the two peaks and there are then a couple of peaks and that may um, you know, have you suspicious that there may be some covert traffic. It may not be, it could just have natural occurrence, you have two modes or whatnot. But you could renormalize using something like Sonic, uh, renormalize the, the spacing and make sure that everything uh, has a uniform spacing. Okay, so some of the uh, research that I've done has been actually uh, funded by the DOD, and so I have a half million dollar uh, Durham, so that's a DOD University research instrumentation program, of which I got uh, more than uh, uh, about 16 sonic boards and two clusters worth of machine that we call our own mini cloud. And so we're now able to do uh, research uh, using this platform and also make that available to quite a few other people. Uh, the other thing that we've done is uh, make, sonic make sonic available via Genie. So you can actually, if you want to now, use UCSD, UC Davis, or RENC nodes, and you can actually, uh, from your own desktop, do some of these similar experiments as well. We have Sonic-enabled uh, exogenes as well. Okay? And so the, the key here then is that now all of a sudden we have a more accessible way to understand our networks. Uh, we're able to uh, understand the performance and actually enhance the performance and security of that. You can now start to talk about a software-defined network measurement platform. So you can actually, uh, and we're looking into this, um, uh, integrating Sonic into a software-defined network so that you can have access and control of these lower level uh, layers. Some of the things we're looking at, for example, are available bandwidth estimation. So turns out that the algorithms, uh, so available bandwidth usually performs very terribly. You know, it doesn't give you a very accurate measure of the amount of available bandwidth. But the key reason is that you're not able to control that inner packet spacing very well. So if I can actually generate packets with exact spacing, and I can measure how much they were perturbed, then I can actually uh, estimate that amount of available bandwidth much better. So we've actually been able to demonstrate that with uh, Sonic, that a lot of those algorithms, uh, Patrick, for example, do actually work quite well when you use Sonic. Okay, so with that, let me go ahead and con conclude. Uh, everything I've talked about so far is uh, published already, so between NSDI last year and this year, and some of these other papers, you can see uh, all the work that I've done. All right, good. Thank you. Thank you. you think this, so what is the incremental cost of Sonic versus doing, I mean, do you think this is, for experimentation, I can see it's very useful, right? And uh, you learned a lot and all of this is very... Uh, yeah, so, so that's asking the question. So for, um, for research, this is a great tool. Right. It is costly because, I mean, uh, when you look, when I showed you that design, those were cores that we were using. So for, for one channel, we're using four to five cores or whatnot. Two channels, we're using eight to 10 cores, uh, which is quite expensive. Uh, some of the things that we're looking at, if you were to actually scale this up, is in, uh, integrating this functionality into line cards, for example, so that you can uh, have more programmatic access uh, to that layer one. But you, this would not 
you would not put this in a production network, you know, exactly. Just it's too expensive. This is research though, so I'm gonna think that's okay. So I still don't understand the, I guess the answer to, to Guru's question, which is that you know, going back to your original issue, it seems that the core problem was that the end host between the packet that the NIC was getting and the packets that the application was getting or not getting in this case. And it seems to me that it could be could have been diagnosed by like looking at something like the packet counter in the NIC, how many packets are the NIC going is getting versus what's the application getting and then sort of trying to figure out yeah, where, yeah. They're, so, where, so where actually, they're dropped. Yeah, so actually the, the DSN paper describes that the packets were dropped between the the NIC and the and the host. So we, we looked at the counters and stuff uh, exactly. We didn't know why they were being dropped. So this we didn't uh, this actually uh, the IMC paper uh, with Dan Freeman and whatnot that helped us to understand that because we, we really didn't understand because we were sending at you know, 100 megabits per second or uh, or a gigabit and here we had 10 gigabit infrastructure and 10 gigabit NIC and you know these uh, pretty beefy servers that should have been able to handle that so we were a little bit surprised that we were dropping packets between that NIC and the host. But that, that, I mean, that is where but, but, but the interesting thing, right, is that the network is doing its job right. The packet counter on NIC A is same as the counter, packet counter on NIC B. Unfortunately, the packet counter application A is not the same as the packet counter application B, right? That's right. right? That, and so it, it seems to me that, 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 I mean, I think Sonic's super awesome for a variety of reasons, but it seems that it's not actually, it, it didn't actually, you know, it told you some interesting things, but the problem could have actually the problem was actually in the end host and probably could have been diagnosed and ultimately had to be diagnosed the, uh, by looking at the end, co end host per behavior and not actually considering, not actually sort of needing, I mean, yeah. the so, problem so wasn't in the Sonic side, it was in the end host side. Right, so I don't disagree with that. Yeah. No, yeah. But it was very interesting agree. research. So yeah, yeah, but but I, guess the, I guess the key though yeah. is that, is that the, the we, interesting couldn't, thing is, we couldn't see what the neck was seeing. Right, that, right, that, right. That, that yeah, problems. yeah. I mean, the, the interesting thing is, is uh, well, yeah. I mean, obviously, you have to look at you, you have to look at the, the bits that are coming into the NIC. But what you could have seen, for example, is look at look at um, the 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 you know the packet counter rate of the NIC over time, you know, and probably you had to look at that, and you know, and then you would see this burstiness and say, oh, wait, you know, you know, that basically we we we've got this strange sort of bursty. Well, bursty well they, they you know they're fairly short bursts, so. Yeah. Um, at the, over time, the average rate is whatever we said. It was 100 megabits per second. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. So, so they're, they're very like, short yeah. bursts. Yeah. And, and it would actually, it actually uh, we, so we tried most of yeah. them. But, we but the, at, the, at, the end, at the end of the day, finding the root cause you know, isn't actually using Sonic. It's because that's not where the problem is. It's that the problem's actually in the end host. So you sort of need a different tool for doing that. Sure. But I, I guess so what we did is we kind of use that to yeah. then motivate that we couldn't see what was going on to Nick. We wanted some ability uh, without using a laser and oscilloscope. We actually had we actually had, you know, a mirror. So we had the fiber coming into the end host. We had a mirror that then had the the same signal go to the oscilloscope that went to the end host. And it was just yeah. <laughs> kind of good. extravagant setup. And you know, the guy I was working with talked about the eye of the diagram and stuff. I worked on ocean school. And here he is excited about the eye of the diagram. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, yes. Real quick, by the way, great work. Is this only true when you own the fiber between the two nodes? Because if you overlaid this over Sonnet, it kind of normalizes everything? So, uh, no. This, so in terms of the, I don't know what this is, but in terms of the covert channels, for example, yeah. you do not have to own uh, the entire network at all. So if you go over Sonnet, which most of these networks do, then they're going to change the impact of rabbit. So, uh, so that, that's a very good question. Uh, analog <laughs> used to have a Sonnet path between yep. Chicago and Atlanta. They then changed that from what I understand. And we so actually own the fiber now. Right? Yeah, so yeah. We, we actually had four loops. I showed you one long loop, and we weren't very matched with the names, but we had a short, medium, and long <laughs> uh, were the names. But anyways, our medium loop went over that Chicago to uh, Atlanta link, which was Sonic. And we actually, uh, in our IMC paper, do talk about some anomalies that we saw with that. 
they changed the uh, they changed the underlying uh, medium, and they also no longer use the same CSR1 Cisco routers. So once we got Song to work, we weren't able to repeat the same exact experiments. In fact, NLR is gone now as well. Yeah, so so you can't even you can't even use NLR. We're talking with Internet 2 to see if we can set some stuff up. But uh, the key is that at that time, which was 2010, uh, that environment doesn't exist. Yeah, because if you're going to OC 1536 and things like yeah. that, then you're subject to two things. They're going to inject their back at arrival times, and then they're going to inject routes that you'll never be able to see. Yeah, so, so this did work on NLR. And there was a time that NLR had a start of path, and by the time we did this experiment, it didn't. Got it. Can any of this be applied to other uh, using the wireless links to see any applications there any benefits in their wireless links? So, like I said, a lot of this was motivated by uh, wireless uh, software defined radio um, uh, and just the control of the medium access layer. I don't know if this transfers or not, because this is. A lot of this does actually depend on the, the high rate, actually. So for the, the covert channel, um, uh, we, if you actually send it at, uh, at a lower rate, uh, the, the channel was actually a little bit less effective in the sense that you couldn't send at 80 kilobits per second for that. Actually, I'm, more like, I'm talking about more like a Wi-Fi environment. We have multiple calls connect the same. Yeah, but what, I guess what are you trying to do the same? I think one thing would be very useful in Wi-Fi would be from a measurement perspective to understand better contention because right now yeah. the way you contend for the for the channel it's, it's hidden within the the, the chip. Right, right. So, so, so that would be like very useful. Yeah, so I mean, I, so a lot of the cross-layer research is done on a wireless domain. You know, we're trying to do cross-layer research yeah. here as well. Yeah, I guess so the fingerprints, I guess getting the reliable fingerprints over a wireless and the wireless access point would be quite difficult, right? Because of all the interference and all the changes. So it would be for your other building block, right? Like a Cisco, different types of Cisco routers, those fingerprints were very uh, what is the prominent or you could distinct. Yeah. But I wonder whether you will have those kinds of distinct fingerprints for wireless. Yeah, I don't know. But I mean the, the nice thing about wireless and something like Sora is that you now have uh, you know, fine grain access to that actual analog signal. So you perhaps could fingerprint different access points. I don't know. I think, I think you've, you've opened up a really kind of interesting issue of like how we can, uh, how we can improve existing you know, vibes and get more interesting and useful information out of them. Right. And, and my suspicion is probably you could just add a little bit of hardware to the NIC or the FI and get a lot and, and, and get a lot of really interesting information to it. I think it. I think that's so, true, right? But the question well, is what what is that little bit you should add? Yeah, yeah. And uh, and we looked, um, you know, DAGs and stuff like that. And it just it did it didn't give us the ability to answer the question that we wanted to answer. And then when we looked in it further, uh, we didn't have that programmatic ability. Yeah. So it seemed like there was kind of a cycle that now you have something like Sonic you say, oh, you know, there are some. You, can, you, you exactly. You can figure out what's useful and, and like, well, gosh, if we had these other, you know, two little, you know, transistors are pretty cheap. Um, right. You know, the optics are kind of what's expensive, and uh, you know, although although things like 10 G base T are applied a lot of transistors, but um, but yeah. for, but for, but that's over over copper. So I actually have a grant with NSF, not a grant. I have a submission with NSF now that would uh, potentially look at, you know, closer that loop. And it's the you know, same. Yeah, the same thing applies to Wi-Fi, getting more introspection into Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. But I, I was really excited by kind of the uh, kind of the software-defined phi sort of side of things. Like with, so with software-defined radio, we can actually you know you, you know use DSP to generate a wireless signal. And I, I really like the idea that that you know normally I can't change the encoding of 10 gigabit Ethernet, but with something like Sonic, it seems yeah, like maybe I could. Exactly. I could do new encodings. And, I mean that that'd be a really I mean as a researcher that's very exciting. Yeah, yeah. so you have, you absolutely can change the encoding of the of the file layer with something like Sonic. Our original yeah. name was actually S D and A, <laughs> which started to be confusing with S D N, so we okay. changed that. For the interest of time, we're gonna let people go okay. and whoever wants to stay more. Okay.